in chapter uh, 27 of Matthew, and in that chapter and in other Gospels, we have miracles that are connected with Calvary. Uh, and uh, shortly after, who can name the miracles that are connected with Calvary? One amazing miracle that came, of course, after Jesus' resurrection. What are some of the miracles that you recall here? All right. The uh, darkness that began at noon, the sixth hour to them, but uh, at noon for us, 12 o'clock, and lasted until three o'clock, three hours. All right, what else? Okay, the veil, significant, significant event. It, it just kind of summarized what Jesus had finished. And his last word was, it is finished. Uh, three words for us, actually one Greek word, but um, it, it, it literally means it has been done. It has been done. One word in Greek. That's what he uttered. In victory. Not in defeat. In victory. He said that. Uh, what else? Two other. Okay. So we had an earthquake. Graves open. And bodies coming out. When did they come out, though? There's, there's a time element here. Did they come out immediately? All right, after, so we have a resurrection really occurring and it's after Jesus, death, burial, and resurrection that uh, these bodies come out. And that also says victory in an amazing way. One victory is paying the price of redemption, and the other victory, which has to happen, is him, Jesus being the first fruits, 1 Corinthians 15, verse 20, uh, paving the way for the resurrection of everyone, 1 Corinthians 15 and John 5. So those are some of the amazing things that are connected with Calvary and shortly thereafter. Look at verse 45, if you would, of Matthew 27, please. Matthew 27, 45. Now from the sixth hour, darkness fell upon all the land until the ninth hour. The Greek word land here, if you're wondering, can mean a small area or the whole earth. It's hard to say. This is a true miracle. It's not a solar eclipse. I'm sure as it was brought out, it's not a sandstorm. Uh, how long does solar eclipse last? A few minutes. This was three hours. And during the Passover, the moon would have been full or close to being full, and you don't have an eclipse with a full moon. This was uh, without question an act of God. So what does the darkness symbolize? What does it symbolize? It symbolizes different things in the Bible. Yes? Okay. So how would you summarize that then? The light of the world is going out, is ebbing away. Jesus is the light of the world physically and the light of the world spiritually. And his life is ebbing away. And uh, so it certainly could symbolize that. What else does uh, darkness symbolize? Okay, okay. God having to allow that to happen. Uh, so God uh, providing 
a sacrifice for sin, uh, God having to turn away. Uh, and it, that was uh, extremely sad, but extremely joyful. At this, there are many paradoxes involved in Calvary, many, and this is one of them. It was the darkest hour and yet the brightest hour the time of greatest sorrow and yet the time of greatest joy because of what it represents. And that's certainly one of the paradoxes. Paradox is truth standing on its head to get attention. It just, how can that be? But it is somehow. Uh, yes, Daddy. Okay. And to go along with that, um, Eli, Eli, Lama Sabachthani. Uh, why, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Absolutely. Which is the cry of a son pleading to a father in whom he has complete trust. Not, again, it's not a cry of defeat. It's the cry of a son who trusts in his father. Um, what else does darkness represent? Okay, morning. Good. Morning and loss. Uh, imagine the anguish. It certainly represents the mental anguish as well as the physical agony that Jesus was going through from the top of his head to the bottom of his feet. Morning, loss. And the terribleness of man to put on a wooden stake his own creator. Just imagine that. Our creator allowing his creation to nail him to a wooden stake where he'd be suspended between earth and heaven for six agonizing hours. It just staggers the mind. Uh, what else does darkness represent? Okay. Uh, evil and sin. Um, you know, definitely when you, when you think of darkness in many contexts, Joe, you definitely see it as a sinful, you know, statement being made. If, if we walk in darkness, there's no fellowship with God, 1 John 1, 6. Uh, God translates us from what? Domain of darkness, Satan's realm, and to the kingdom of so a dark realm of condemnation, and we're translated from that into light, uh, the kingdom of God's dear son. And so you definitely think of uh, sin being translated from sin to light. And it definitely, you know, represents sin in many contexts, darkness. I'd like to suggest something else that the, that the darkness represents. Look at Amos chapter 8. All these, I believe, are true. I believe they all fit the context, immediate and uh, large context. Look at Amos chapter 8 and uh, verse 9. This was said, uh, you know, anywhere from probably 10 to 20 years before Israel fell at the hand of the Assyrians in 722 BC. God, through the prophet Amos, said in verse 9 of Amos 8, and it will come about in that day, declares the Lord God, I shall make the sun go down at noon and make the earth dark in broad daylight. Verse 10, then I shall turn your festivals into mourning and all your songs into lamentation. I will bring sackcloth on everyone's loins and baldness on every head. I will make it like a time of mourning for an only son. And the end of it will be like a bitter day. And so in Amos chapter 8, what does darkness represent here? It represents judgment. That's it's exactly right. And judgment came right quick. It, at a time when Israel was prosperous, 
at a time when Israel was very prideful. Uh, as, as Moses said, Jeshurun, the Holy One, waxed fat and kicked. And God said, I'm not going to allow that. And so judgment came to Israel in 722 BC, and the darkness spoken of here uh, was a prelude to that judgment. Uh, their world was going to end. And then um, I'll just mention these because of time, but in Jeremiah 4.23, Jeremiah 4.23, and in Isaiah 13 and verse 10, and so you can look those up for yourself. Again, two more of many statements in the scripture where darkness uh, is a prelude to judgment. Now, that being true, was darkness in a symbolic or figurative sense a prelude to the fall of Jerusalem and wicked, wicked Jews who refused to believe? Was, was darkness a physical statement of warning given by God, though it would be symbolic, is it something that he said would, would occur in reference to the fall of Jerusalem? Remember Matthew 24. Yes, it is. Look at Matthew 24. Matthew 24 and verse 29. Like Israel... Uh, and Jerusalem before 722 and 586, this Israel was also waxing fat and kicking. Prosperous, very prosperous, very prosperous. Uh, they did not know their own God. And uh, Jesus said, among other things that would happen in verse 29, he says, immediately after the tribulation of those days, this is Matthew 24, the sun will be darkened, the moon will not give its light. The stars will fall from the sky. The powers of the heavens will be shaken. Then the sign of the Son of Man will appear. Now remember the time text of uh, this passage here, verse 34. Truly I say to you, this generation will not pass away until all these things take place. And so that would certainly include verse 29. So is darkness symbolically spoken of here? Was it a prelude to judgment that would come upon Jerusalem and the unbelieving, rebellious Jews? Absolutely. Their world was going to come crashing down. Their powers, which are represented by the stars, their powers are going to come to an end. Their world is ending. And it's going to happen in just a generation from this time period. And so among other things, I, I want us to understand that darkness represents judgment. And those, those same people uh, Jesus is praying for, many of them will not repent. They will continue to rebel. They will get even more rebellious. And God is going to end their, their nation. He's going to bring their nation to an end. And uh, I think darkness in part at least represents that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think so. I, I think so. I, I I don't I don't discount any of these other thoughts as well. I think that there's a lot of things it represents, but I think judgment is one of them. And you see that in many of the prophets. Yeah. Okay. Um, let's go a little further here, if we may. Verse, uh, let's look at verse 46 now. Verse 46, about the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice saying, Eli, Eli, that's Hebrew for my God, my God. Lama sabachthani, that's Aramaic, or why have you forsaken me? Now, why did Jesus say that? Why did he say that? I know you discussed this probably last week. Why did David say that? And David said it first. 
You look at the, the situation in Psalm 22, and David is clearly in a bad situation there. Why would David say that, and now Jesus say that here? Is it because they don't have faith in God? Or because they do have faith and trust in God? It's because they do. Go back, go down to Psalm 20. To go back to Psalm 22 and uh, read the rest of what David said, and you'll see what I mean. So, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? That's just verse one. That's verse one. But from there, verse one, David continues, far from my deliverance are the words of my groaning. Oh my God, I cry by day, but thou dost not answer, and by night, but I have no rest. Now, are there many of the Psalms that express thoughts like that? Absolutely. Absolutely. This is the cry of a trusting son appealing to his father for help. In verse 3, yet thou art holy. O thou who art enthroned upon the praises of Israel, in thee our fathers trusted. They trusted, and you delivered them. And so what's he saying? I'm appealing to you in this way because I know you will deliver me. That's what he's saying. In verse 5, to thee they cried out, and they were delivered. In thee they trusted and were not disappointed. In verse 11 of Psalm 22 Be not far from me, for trouble is near, for there is none to help. And then going down to verse 19, as he closes out the psalm, it's it's their words of victory. But thou, O Lord, be not far off. O thou, my help, hasten to my assistance. Deliver my soul from the sword, my only life from the power of the dog. Save me from the lion's mouth and from the horns of the wild oxen. Thou dost answer me. I will tell of thy name to my brethren. Remember this from Hebrews. In the midst of the assembly, I will praise thee. Uh, That's from Hebrews chapter 12, isn't it? Or 13? Uh, 2, chapter 2. It is in chapter 2. Yeah, Hebrews chapter 2. You who fear the Lord, praise him. All you descendants of Jacob, glorify him. Stand in awe of him, all you descendants of Israel, for he has not despised nor abhorred the afflictions of the afflicted, neither has he hid his face from him, but when he cried to him for help, he heard. He heard David, and did he hear Jesus? Yes, yes, he did. Um, These are not words of a son giving up on God, but again, it's a cry and appeal for help from their father, and God answered in different ways, but he answered. Both were delivered from their enemies. Jesus, of course, by overcoming them through his death, David, in various ways, the Philistines, Absalom, just some of those ways. And both David and Jesus were delivered from the greatest enemy of all, eternal death. Um, Into thy hands I commit my spirit, he said, Psalm 16. I know, uh, I trust that you will bring my spirit back to life. Into thy hands I commit my spirit. Both were delivered different ways, but both were delivered. God heard. So it's the cry of a child appealing to his father in complete trust. And both were heard in different ways. Um, any, any, thought, any thoughts on that? Any more? Uh, yes, sir. The end of this psalm is not just victory. It's the people's response to that victory. And all the ends of the earth will remember and turn to the Lord. And Amen. One generation will tell the next generation and then tell a future generation yet to be born. And 
And so the result of the suffering of David's case there and Jesus' case here results in worldwide generational people coming to know the Lord based on what he's done through this suffering. Amen. The result of suffering is grace. Yeah, amen. And so uh, there are many, many sons and daughters as Isaiah 53 that would come to the Father as a result of this. And here are sons and daughters gathered this evening who are studying the same thing and using it for that very purpose, brother. This generation is praising God and uh, God is hearing Jesus' prayer in this generation. Yeah, great point. Any, anybody else? Um, it's verse 48 of Matthew uh, 27, immediately one of them ran, taking a sponge, he filled it with sour wine, put it on a reed and gave him a drink. Now this may have been um, after something recorded in John's gospel, chapter 19, verse 28, where Jesus said, I thirst. And it seems to fit the timing of this, I thirst. And then Matthew says, one of them took a sponge, put sour wine on it and a reed and put it to his mouth. And it seems to be an act of compassion. I don't know, what do you think? It seems to be an act of compassion. Um, Yeah, I, I think that's probably the drink of the soldiers. <laughs> probably some of the soldiers' wine. Yeah, and, and maybe it's not an act of compassion. Maybe it's, it's just more uh, humiliation, to your point. Okay, yeah. Maybe so. Maybe it's just trying to make matters worse. No compassion. Um, I think typically Pilate would not have given the body for somebody to bury. I think there's a lot of unique things here. I'm sorry? No, no, he would not have been there. But a lot of things here are unusual. His body would not have been given to someone to bury. He was, a, he was accused and charged of insurrection. Typically, you, you don't give them an honorable burial. But a lot of things are uh, not typical here. So, but to your point, it could be uh, another way of making it worse. Any other thoughts on that? Or it could have been somebody feeling sorry for him and take some of the soldier's drink and, and uh, put it up to his lips. In any case, uh, Verse 49, most in the crowd certainly had no mercy. Verse 49, but the rest of them said, let us see whether Elijah will come and save him. And Jesus cried out again with a loud voice and yielded up his spirit. When they, uh, they thought he had said Elijah, the name Elijah and God are very similar in Hebrew. And so they thought he was crying for Elijah. But at this point, uh, Jesus, notice, uh, notice what Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John point out about Jesus' attitude in regard to this whole situation. Was anything forced upon him? Was there anything that he had to do other than the Father's will? Was what is what word is uh, in the, is used here again to show this is all voluntary on Jesus' part? Yeah. Uh -huh. That's that's exactly right. Matthew is very careful about the word he uses here. It doesn't say any died. 
He said he gave up his spirit. He yielded his spirit. This was a voluntary act. And all the gospel writers are very careful to let us know that all of this is voluntarily done. No one is forcing him to do any of this. Love for the Father and love for us is the driver for all of this. And uh, it's all voluntarily done. And so uh, Luke's account says at this point, he says, Father, into thy hands, I uh, commend my spirit, give my spirit into your care. And then John's account adds, it is finished. It is finished. That's, that's one Greek word again. And that's a term that a worker might use coming in from the field after a long day's work. He might use that term. It's, it's completely done. It's also the term that a merchant would often use when a debt was paid. He would use this term, paid in full. And uh, it might even be a term used by a soldier after a victory. It is, it is done. And this certainly was victorious. Any comments here? Verse 51, let's look a little further here. Behold, here's one of the miracles. Uh, the veil of the temple was torn in two. Now, what time of day would it have been that it was torn in two? How long did he hang on that terrible tree? So it started at the third hour of the day. Jewish day began at six. So it started... He was crucified from the third hour of the day, which would be nine o'clock. The darkness began at 12, and then until how many hours did Jesus suffer on that cross? Six hours, and so three o'clock to us since the day began at six. So ninth hour of the day, and typically, during that time, you have the evening sacrifice taking place. So you've got priests and a number of people gathered there at the temple. And it was something that would be immediately recognized because you'd have a large group of people, and especially the priesthood, where you're, you're offering the evening sacrifice and suddenly this curtain, you had, of course, you had two rooms. Um, you had the temple, that you had the holy place and the most holy place. And you had a curtain that separated these two. How, how big was that curtain? Anybody know? It said it took 30 rabbis to carry this thing. It was just enormous in weight and size. It's clearly an act of God. It wasn't, well, as old as going to rip anyway. There's no way it happened naturally. But that curtain tore right down the middle. And so it would have been something that they could have seen. Now, what's the significance of this? Why is that brought out as something important? He, he, it is finished. The debt is paid. Uh, what is it saying? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. His sacrifice is the one sacrifice everybody needs once for all. Let's look at Hebrews 10 and uh, let's, let's get the uh, summary from the Hebrew writer. Hebrews chapter 10. And uh, give me a, someone read, anyone, just begin 
when you're ready, verse 19 through 22, please. through the veil, that is, his flesh. And since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a sincere heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Amen. Go back to chapter 9 now of Hebrews. Chapter 9. And um, verse 24 and 25, someone read that, please. 9, 24, and 25. So that tells you right there, that passage alone, that the, the holy place is a type of heaven. It's a type of heaven. And so Jesus, and that Ark of the Covenant, by the way, is said to be in at least two places, the footstool of God. And so you have God meeting with his people here in this place. And the blood of Jesus, as it were, being offered to God here because that's where God met with them. And that blood then of Jesus, not an animal, but of a perfect human lamb, if you will, a perfect sacrifice, um, being able to provide redemption for all mankind that it will accept God's gift. That, that sacrifice then offered to God is acceptable as justification for our sins. And so in that way, God, through his son, is, is just. He punished sin in his own son. And in doing that, he's also justifier of the ones who are truly guilty. So he's just and justifier in the same action. And so when Jesus brings his blood then to the Father, he opens the way. And what this is saying is he, he has opened the way to heaven because this is a foreshadowing, a symbol of heaven. He's opened the way to heaven. And no longer through animal sacrifice, but through this one sacrifice, it is sufficient for all mankind. He died once for all. Hebrews 10.10, 10, one sacrifice. Uh, it's extremely significant. Someone else want to add to that? Any thoughts on that? It did. Yeah. Would that have connection to that? Absolutely. Absolutely, it does. I appreciate that. And I'd love to do a study of that with you sometime, but this is all restoring things back to that original Ed Edenic relationship. The key to understanding the Bible is the first two chapters, really. Without, if sin doesn't occur, you don't need chapter three through, through Revelation. You don't even need them. Um, but that's the situation God wanted, a close relationship, walking in the garden, the cool of the day with his creation, Adam and Eve ruling over the earth from Eden, um, which is the garden of the Lord. God invites them to his garden. But when, of course, sin comes, they have to leave. And the whole Bible plan is to get us back to that Edenic relationship, though far greater and far better. Uh, and you, when you read Revelation 22, uh, well, let's read Revelation 22. We're, since we're running out of time, look at Revelation 22, because that's exactly what uh, John says is going to happen. Revelation 22, in verse 1, then he showed me a river of the water of life, clearest crystal, coming from the throne of God and of the Lamb, 
In the middle of its street on either side of the river was the tree of life, bearing 12 kinds of fruit, yielding its fruit every month, and the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. There will no longer be any curse in the throne of God. The lamb will be in it, and the bond servants will serve him. So there you have basically Eden restored. What was lost here is regained in another tree. So you got one tree of life here, and you got another tree of life at the end. But it's a cross. And it, it took great pain and agony to, to achieve what God said had to happen. But such is the terribleness of sin. And we don't, I just don't think we appreciate how terrible sin really is. But such is the terribleness of sin. And Jesus paid that price so that Eden, that relationship is restored. The cherubim, remember when Adam and Eve had to leave the garden, uh, who were placed, who were placed, not what, but who, these are persons, who were placed at the uh, entrance, cherubim at the entrance. Now that's the garden of the Lord, and they're placed at the entrance there to guard it so that no one will go in there. And uh, by the way, which way did, was that entrance facing? Which way did the temple face? East. You see, and so you get glimpses of Eden, you know, in Israel and the various types and foreshadows in Israel. God seeking to restore that original Edenic relationship, though far greater. Yes. God holding this book open the Bible. Yeah. And you ask the question who is worthy to open the book? And the only one that's worthy to open the book is the one that has the appearance of the Lamb that has been slain. Yeah. So yeah. He had to die worthy to open the book. Yes. And of course, by that time, Revelation, you know, it had been accomplished and um, been raised from the dead. And because he fully did the Father's will, then uh, as he said he would do, I did not come to destroy the law, but I did come to fulfill it. And he did, he fulfilled every demand of that law. It's been a joy and a blessing to study with you again. Lord willing, we'll pick it up right here next week. Thank you.